Okay. <clears throat> well, welcome back, folks. We have been talking about the history of the Ozarks, and it seems like for about the last month and a half, we've been talking about the Civil War. And we finally finished that up last week. We're done with the Civil War. Uh, you know, that's all been fought. Everything is done. And the Ozarks, we're going to take it up now from about 1865 to about 1900. And that period of time is what I generally re refer to as a period of turmoil and rebirth. Uh, it was a really hard time in the Ozarks. Um, there was a period there for about from about 1865 to about 1880, 1885, that the Ozarks was just, uh, it had really gone backwards after the guerrilla warfare of the Civil War. And then the railroad came in, actually came in in the 1870s, but it took it about 10 years to really start showing an effect. And from that point on, the Ozarks begin to blossom, begin to bloom. Uh, and so it's kind of like a period where everything just fell apart. You went into an anarchy type situation, and then it all began to kind of heal over and get better and so that's what we're going to be talking about the next few weeks and this week and next week in particular we're going to be talking about a couple of incidents that if you're from the ozarks i can guarantee you you've heard of particularly the one we'll be talking about next week but this week we're going to be talking about the uh, experience of wild bill hickok in springfield now if you're like me, well, pardon me, I'm getting ahead of myself here. We've got our Ozarker, we got our Missourian of note first, and this is a, a really famous person. Uh, you probably don't recognize him. You might recognize some of his achievements. This is Charles Marion Russell. He was one of the great painters of the Old West. Born in St. Louis, raised in St. Louis, lived most of his life in St. Louis. And, uh, you know, just really one, probably one of the top five painters of the Old West. And uh, he lived during this period of time that I call turmoil and rebirth. And, uh, you know, just really did a, a fantastic job of painting. So as I was getting ready to say before I got ahead of myself there, uh, I grew up in the 50s. I'm you know, I'm just a child compared to some people out there. I know um, I was just a young child and I used to watch TV shows, Old West TV shows. I mean, I thrived on those things. Of course, uh, you really couldn't watch much of anything else in the 50s because that's about what was on most of the, for the most part was TV Westerns. My favorite or one of my favorites was Wild Bill Hickok, The Adventures of Wild Bill Hickok with Guy Madison and Andy Devine. I mean, I watched that show. I mean, I thought there was nobody greater than Wild Bill Hickok. Of course, I didn't know the real Wild Bill at the time. I just knew that he always wore the white hat and always did the right thing. Uh, that wasn't always the case, as it turned out. What I didn't know and what I didn't find out until quite a lot of years later when I really began studying uh, local history was that Wild Bill Hickok actually got his start right here in Springfield, Missouri. Um, we we associate Wild Bill with Abilene and Hayes City and uh, Deadwood, South Dakota. We don't associate him with Springfield, Missouri. And he actually spent approximately four years in Springfield uh, during the Civil War and the period after the Civil War. And that's where he gained his big reputation as a gunfighter. So we're going to look at that today. So let's look at James Butler Hickok, better known as Wild Bill Hickok, born in Troy, Troy Grove, Illinois, uh, May 27, 1837. Uh, he was raised in a very abolitionist home. Uh, his mom and dad were strongly anti-slavery. In fact, the case, his home actually served as a station on the Underground Railroad, which was this series of houses that were set up where escaped slaves could stay until they reached the next station on the house escaping from the south so he he was raised in an extremely anti-slavery home uh grew up you know 
on the Wild West. You know, Illinois in the 1830s, 1840s was about as west as you could get. And it wasn't like Illinois today. Well, maybe. <laughs> I won't go there. Okay. Uh, uh, he grew up hunting and fishing, uh, just really uh, thrived on the outdoors, became an extremely good shot with a rifle and a pistol, uh, which served him well later. Uh, by the age of 18, Hickok had bored of life in Illinois uh, and decided he wanted to go west. And west at that time was Kansas and Nebraska. And so he ends up in what we know as bleeding Kansas. We might remember that in the late 1850s, Kansas was basically the site of a civil war that preceded the actual civil war of the United States. And so uh, Hickok ends up moving to Kansas, getting involved in this, in this mini civil war. He even rode with Jim Lane's regulators, uh, red leggers for a short time. You might remember that Jim Lane's red leggers were the ones that burned Osceola, Missouri. We talked about that last week. Um, he was part of the guerrilla warfare that was going on. But for whatever reason, he didn't stay long with uh, the red leggers. He ended up uh, in Nebraska working for the Pony Express. Now, he was not a Pony Express rider. A lot of people have written this and and a lot of people have assumed that he rode the Pony Express. He really did not. He was a teamster. Uh, he worked with the horses. Uh, he did befriend a young Bill Cody, who most definitely was a Pony Express rider, and they became very good friends at this period of time, and that served him well a little bit later, as you'll see. He also met up with Kit Carson, who was not a young man by this time, uh, working on the Santa Fe Trail, and so it was here that that he met up with some of his childhood heroes. It's amazing, you know, that how many of these Old West characters actually interacted in one way or the other. Uh, and this is just one of those examples. This is the earliest known photo we have of Wild Bill Hickok at the age of about tw 20 when he was in Nebraska. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, Hickok had not grown into himself yet. Hickok later on gains quite a reputation as a ladies man. Now, I'm assuming there's some women out there looking at young Wild Bill here thinking, boy, uh, he's not exactly the most handsome man I've ever seen. Well, you know, he had to kind of grow into himself, as you'll find out here in a minute. He had not quite developed his image, you know, so to say. I, I think often uh, I'm a real... Uh, big fan of the Gaither vocal uh, quartet. And I love Guy Penrod. And I bet there's some of you out there that love Guy Penrod just as much as I do, listening to him and, and all. Uh, you know, Guy Penrod is known for his long hair and his beard and uh, his kind of Western attire. That's how he kind of, that's his image. By the way, Bill Gaither advised him at a very young age when they were beginning to work with the quartet to... Uh, develop an image. If you've ever seen a picture of Guy Penrod as a young man when he was at Liberty University, um, I, I'm not being sarcastic here or negative, but Guy needed to uh, enhance his image. Let's put it that way. I, I kind of say that about Wild Bill. He had not quite reached his image yet. Uh, so anyway, Let's go on with the McKim. What happens next? Well, Wild Bill was working for the Overland Stage Company, the Pony Express area. He's working as a teamster, and he's working at a station up at Rock Creek, Nebraska. And there was a dispute over the ownership of this station. Every station was owned by an individual person, and the Pony Express kind of contracted with them. Well, there was a dispute about exactly who owned this Rock Creek station. And so a man by the name of McCandless, who was kind of the, the bully of the area, uh, he felt like he was the owner of the station. On top of that, he and Hickok had had a lot of conflict. Uh, there's stories that it all centered around a woman. And, you know, again, wherever Hickok went, there always to be, seemed to be women around him. Well, uh, apparently McCandless and Hickok got into a lot of the uh, kind of like a bullying situation. McCandless was kind of the bully of the county, and he was kind of bullying Hickok, calling him nicknames, called him Duck Bill. 
because he kind of had a, a protruding lip, which he later on covers with his big handlebar mustache. Um, well, anyway, they got into a dispute about this, about who owned the station. So McCandless and two of his associates decide they're going to come to Rock Creek and they're going to take the station over. Uh, and so they ride into the station July of 1861, just immediately as the Civil War is beginning to take hold. And uh, he tries to take the station over. And Hickok defends the owner and his wife who are there. And they end up in a big shootout and Hickok kills all three of the McCandless associates, McCandless and his two associates. Uh, big deal. I mean, you know, killing three men is quite the thing. Uh, Hickok, like I said, is just a really, really good shot. Well, McCandless has a lot of friends. Hickok makes the wise decision that maybe it's time for him to leave Rock Creek, Nebraska. And he does what a lot of people did under those circumstances. He goes to Kansas and joins the Union Army, okay? Uh, because now he's kind of protected since he's part of the United States Army. Remember, the Civil War has just started. So here is a uh, image of David McCandless, the guy that uh, he killed along with his two associates. These are the first men that we're aware of that Hickok has killed, only 20 years old, very young man. Um, Hickok, like I said, he immediately leaves Rock Creek and goes and volunteers for the Army. He hooks up with General Lyon's Army unit. Remember, General Lyon is the one that is sent east to St. Louis and then eventually ends up at Wilson's Creek, uh, right outside of Springfield, to uh, and is engaged in this big battle of Wilson's Creek and Will's Carthage. Uh, and it was here that Hickok begins to play a role in the army. He is a scout. He's a spy, is what he is. He's a scout. He's the guy they send out uh, to try to find out where the other groups are, where the where the opposing army is. Later on, uh, he ends up uh, actually uh, taking on uh, different. Uh, he he becomes different people in a sense. Takes on uh, other characters and slips into the Confederate camps to uh, kind of uh, say see how many people they have. Uh, he also uses his skills as a sniper in battle because, again, he's a terrific shot, and the Union Army figured this out real fast. Uh, we know that at the Battle of Pea Ridge, which he was at, as well as Carthage and Wilson's Creek, that he used his skill to kill several Confederate soldiers as a sniper. He did not kill General uh, Ben McCullough, the leader of the Confederate Army, as has been written many, many times. Uh, that was a rumor for decades that he was the actual the killer of uh, Ben McCullough. He was not. We know exactly who did that job now, but it wasn't Big Bill Hickok. Uh, he continued fighting for the Union side sporadically throughout the Civil War, but he served primarily as a spy and a scout. Dangerous job. If you're caught uh, in that capacity, you're immediately executed. So uh, he took on some really dangerous jobs. Again, this is a photograph that we have of Hickok uh, during the Civil War. And again, you can see he needs a little cleaning up here. He needs a little enhancement of his image. Um, you can also see his protruding lip here. You can see why McCandless might have called him Duckbill. Uh, he had a little bit of a big upper lip, uh, which kind of hung over. Uh, well, the Civil War ends, and Hickok settles in Springfield. Now, why Springfield? Well, it's simple, folks. Uh, this has been his home base for about four years while the Civil War is going on. On top of that, Springfield is a wide open town now. Springfield has been occupied by the Union Army for most of the time of the Civil War. Uh, early on, the Confederates had it, but for the most part, it's been in the hands of the Union Army. We all know where Army units base themselves during war you have all sorts of things going on, gambling, brothels, uh, you name it. Anything in that capacity uh, was here in Springfield. It was a wild west town, folks. Springfield was just a really rough town immediately after the Civil War. Most of the good citizens had left, and what was left was uh, 
the, the gambling houses, the drinking houses, the saloons, the brothels, et cetera. And Hickok began to gain a reputation as quite the uh, wild man. This is where he began to gain his reputation as Wild Bill Hickok. Uh, it's said that one of his favorite uh, activities, he had a big black mare that he rode, uh, and she was well-trained, called her Black Nell. And he would bring Black Nell into the gambling houses, and she would jump up on the pool tables. And uh, he would kind of make her spin around, and then he'd jump off the pool table on the horse and ride out. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I've played a lot of pool in my life. Uh, I'm not for sure that most pool tables have been strong enough to hold a, you know, a big horse and a man. But who knows? Maybe they were better built back in these days. But that's the story. Uh, he did a lot of gambling in Springfield, and particularly at this period of time, right after the Civil War, one of his favorite gambling haunts was the Lion Hotel, named after General Lyon, right off the square of Springfield. And one of his favorite gambling partners was a man by the name of Davis Tut. Now, Davis Tut was a well-known figure in the Ozarks, just like Hickok became. Uh, his family was from Yaleville, Arkansas, and uh, they had had a big feud down in Arkansas with another family, and uh, they, he was kind of a well-known man. He, he served in the same capacity with the Confederate Army that Hickok had served with in the Union Army. He was a scout and a spy, and they knew of each other. They had met up. They were, they were good buddies in a rivalry sense of, sense of way. Uh, there was also, again, legends of women. Uh, Hickok uh, had become quite the ladies' man, and the story goes, this is the rumor, that he had reportedly impregnated Tut's sister, Lottie. Tut got upset about that because Hickok had no intention of marrying her and she was going to have a child. So the story goes that he, in turn, took up with Hickok's current love interest, a lady by the name of Susanna Moore, which made Hickok mad. So reportedly, the rumor is that they had a falling out over women. Again, who knows? The immediate cause of the great gunfight between Wild Bill Hickok and Davis Tut that turned out to be the big event was a gambling situation. July 20th, 1865, they were gambling at the Kelly and Kerr Saloon located inside the Lion Hotel on South Street, about a half a block off the square. And uh, Hickok may have been a great uh, person at shooting. He was not a very good gambler. He loved to gamble. He gambled his whole life, but apparently he wasn't all that good at it. And Tut apparently cleaned him out, took all of his money. Uh, and on top of that, there was also a debt owed. And supposedly uh, Hickok admitted the debt. He told him, he said, I know I owe you some money. He wrote him out an IOU. He said, here. And there was a little bit of argument about how much money. Uh, supposedly Tut thought he owed him more money than that. So he grabs up Hickok's gold watch that's laying on the gambling table. Now, folks, back in these days, that was not a good thing to do. Uh, Hickok had indeed got his gold watch from his father, and that was probably the one thing he had of his dad's that he wanted and had. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a family heirloom. And this happened a lot back in these days that men were passed down the pocket watches from their fathers, grandfathers, great grandfathers. And Hickok took real offense at this. And he said, hey, he told Tut, he said, you know, don't you be showing this around and don't be bragging. I'll get you your money and you give me my watch back. But I don't want this to be a source of, of contention. In other words, he didn't want to be embarrassed about this. So here's Wild Bill Hickok, here's Davis Tut, and that's a picture of Lottie Tut, uh, the woman that supposedly Hickok had impregnated, Davis Tut's sister. Well, the next day, there's going to be a gunfight. Now, folks, we've all seen these gunfights on TV and movies. We've all seen High Noon, you know, with Gary Cooper walking down the street. Uh, we've all seen uh, James Arness's Matt Dillon uh, hundreds of times have I seen James Arness at the beginning of the gun smoke, walk out on the streets of Dodge City, pull his gun to gunfight. 
Uh, you would think that happened a thousand times a day in the Old West. Folks, that kind of thing didn't happen. You can count on my fingers how many times a gunfight like that happened in the, in the Old West. That's not how gunfights happen. Most of them occurred behind doors and, and through windows and around corners. They were almost more like assassinations than gunfights. You did not see the two guys walking down Main Street at each other, pulling the gun, simultaneously shooting each other. That just didn't occur, but only a few times in the Old West. The first time it occurred was in Springfield, Missouri, July 21st, 1865. Um, Bill Hickok is notified the next day that Tut is out on the square bragging about cleaning him up saying, hey, I've got Bill Hickok's watch, waving it around, and he owes me money. You know, he's not so tough after all, is he? I mean, just typical stuff. You know, we've all seen this happen. Hickok is embarrassed. He's mad. He's angry. And so he basically sends notice to Tut through his friends. He tells him, he said, hey, I warned you about this. And if you show up on the square again, I've got news for you. Dead men can't walk. That's exactly what he told his friends to tell Tut. He said, don't be doing this ever again. Well, sure enough, about 6 o'clock, July 21st in the afternoon, uh, Hickok is told that Tut's out on the square again, waving his watch around, bragging about cleaning out Wild Bill. And he is really upset. So he walks out onto the square. And they look at each other about 75 yards apart. Folks, that's three quarters of the length of a football field. Now, you know, I've done my fair share of shooting in my life with a handgun. Uh, I actually used to do this quite a bit. And, and I got, I'll be honest, I got pretty good at it. Hitting something from 75 yards with a handgun, a, a person that's got another gun aiming it at you is not an easy thing to do. I can guarantee you that it takes an enormous amount of skill to shoot somebody from 75 yards with a handgun. That's with the modern handgun. That's not with the handgun like they were using. They were using older type guns. I mean, it was a it was something else. Now, we don't know exactly who pulled the, the gun first. Some people, some witnesses claimed it was Tut. Some people claimed it was Hickok. The general opinion is, is that they both kind of pulled their guns simultaneously. Uh, we know that Tut shot first, and he missed Hickok completely. Hickok shot and shot Tut directly through the heart. That was from the words of the coroner in his coroner's report. Uh, just an unbelievable shot. This is the gunfight where Wild Bill gains his reputation as the greatest gunfighter of the Old West, which was deserved. It's also the gunfight that set the stereotype for every gunfight you ever saw on TV and in the movies. Again, this is the first time this thing happened. Uh, he was using an old 1851 Navy Colt revolver. It was single action, cap and ball, 36 caliber. It was about 13 inches long, weighed two and a half pounds. This thing is heavy. I mean, that's a hip. You go down to your weight room and where you live and lift up one of those three pound weights. Just imagine how heavy that gun must have been. And this was kind of the favored gun at the time, this, this Navy Colt revolver used by Hickok, Doc Holliday, Jesse James, several of the old Wild West characters. But folks, it's, a, it's a, just an absolutely amazing shot that he made. Um, if you go to the square in Springfield, you they have plaques embedded in the sidewalks where each man was standing. It says here, James Butler, Wild Bill Hickok stood when he shot Dave Tut, July 21st, 1865, over a gambling debt. Tut fell 75 yards to the northwest. Uh, if you know the Springfield Square, this is over on the very southeast corner of the square. And this is over by where the HERS building is today. That At that time, it was the county courthouse. And Tut was standing here. Hickok was standing here, uh, shot him clear across the square at about 75 yards. Just an absolutely unbelievable shot. Um, 
Dave Tut was buried in Maple Park Cemetery in Springfield. Uh, he's still buried there. This is a monument that was put up not that many years ago. It said born 1839 in Yaleville, Arkansas, died July 21st, 1865 on the public square in Springfield, Missouri, and obviously put there by some of his family. Okay, so what happens next? Well, Hickok goes on trial. He's immediately uh, arrested, turns himself in, released on $2,000 bond, which several people in the city put up for him. Uh, he has a trial. It happens real fast. He's tried by the judge, who happens to be a uh, man by the name of Pony Boyd. He is defended by John Phelps. John Phelps later on becomes the governor of Missouri. John Phelps was the big man of Springfield at this time. He was the, he was the kingmaker of Springfield. He's the one who owned the Phelps farm south of Springfield, where his wife had, had stored uh, Nathaniel Lyon's body during the Battle of Wilson's, after the Battle of Wilson's Creek. It is now Phelps Grove Park. He is the lawyer for Hickok. Uh, it's an, only a matter of minutes. Uh, they have a jury trial. Uh, they only deliberate about an hour and a half. They come back with a verdict that it was a fair fight, that Tut and Hickok were defending themselves, and that Hickok got the better of it. So he's released. Now, Hickok's feeling kind of a fool of himself. You know, he's kind of walking around town like I'm the big man in town now. You know, look at me. I've had this big gunfight. I've shot a guy from 75 yards. He starts gambling and drinking and womanizing even more. Uh, doesn't exactly make friends of the people in Springfield. Remember, Springfield, not a lot of good citizens in Springfield. So they're not too happy about this. Well, he decides he's going to run for town marshal. Uh, this He's never been a law enforcement officer before, but he kind of thinks now I'm going to be town marshal. So he runs for election that fall as town marshal and gets whipped. I mean, doesn't get very many votes at all. Uh, he's upset about it. He's embarrassed about it because he thought he was going to win. And he finally just packs his gear and, and heads off. He basically is thumbing his nose at Springfield, says, I don't care if I ever come back to this town or not. I didn't think for many years that he ever came back to Springfield, but upon further reading, apparently he was back a couple of times for one reason or the other. But for the most part, he abandoned Springfield, never to return. Now, uh, this is a document that was found in the uh, Springfield archives not too long ago. And it basically says state of Missouri County agreeing to the honorable the judge of the Circuit Court of Greene County. The undersigned has to inform you that one Davis Tut was killed yesterday by one James B. Hickok, misspelled. Uh, as coroner of Greene County, I impaneled a jury to investigate the cause of the death of said Davis Tut. The jury, after hearing the evidence, makes the following return that said Tut came to his death in a manner and by means of a pistol shot. And the jury further find that the said violence causing said death was committed by a certain James B. Haycock. Uh, they can't get his name spelled right. <laughs> Respectively, J.F. Brown, coroner of Green County, of uh, coroner of Green County of Green County, Missouri. So that was, uh, you know, basically uh, the document that was found that that signifies that he killed Dave Tut. The first thing Hickok does after his killing of Dave Tut is go get his picture taken. This is a picture that was taken by a photo gallery uh, in Springfield, Missouri, just days after the Tut Davis, uh, pardon me, the Davis Tut Wild Bill Hickok shootout. Now you can see that Wild Bill's cleaned up. He's starting to get into his image. He's tall. He's lean. He's got his hair still long, but it's obviously combed. He's he's got a you know nice frock coat on. Got his guns and his belt there. Uh, got a big handlebar mustache. He's finally getting into himself a little bit here. And you can kind of see where the ladies probably thought he was quite the handsome man at this time. Like I said, he was about 6'3", which was a pretty good sized man for this day and age. Uh, very muscular, very lean. Now, the Hickok-Tuck gunfight made Hick Hickok an overnight sensation. 
And while he's still in Springfield, a couple of writers show up uh, and they decide they're going to make him into a legend. Now, dime novels at this time were very popular amongst the youth of America. Uh, and two men, George Nichols and Ned Buntline, were the most prolific writers of the dime novels. And these were uh, like almost like comic books uh, that really invented stories about people of the Old West and made them into heroes. They did it with Kit Carson. They did it with Buffalo Bill Cody. They did it with uh, anybody that they could find to make a hero out of. Uh, General Custer, et cetera. Even some people like Jesse James and Billy the Kid. But they decide they're going to make a hero out of Wild Bill. And so Wild Bill becomes a nationally known person uh, by these dime novels. Uh, this is Ned Buttline, the man that wrote the one that was the most popular. And this is a copy of one of those Beatles dime library, Wild Bill, the Wild West Duelist. And you can see here these lined up back to back, which did not happen. You know, uh, they just made stuff up. You know, they would take events, for instance, uh, you know, Buntline supposedly wrote that uh, back when he killed uh, Dave McCandless in Rock Creek, Nebraska, he killed 10 men. He only killed three, which is enough, but he wrote that he killed 10. And he later on is involved in Indian fights and just, you know, he just writes these things. He just writes them kind of like the tabloids that you see in uh, grocery stores, where they just make stuff up to attract attention. And uh, he was making Wild Bill a, a world-famous gunfighter. And he was a gunfighter, and he was good. Unfortunately, it had a bad effect. Everybody out there that wants to be the best gunfighter, who do you think they're going to try to have a fight with? Wild Bill Hickok. So now... He's got to live down his reputation. In the meanwhile, Hickok's involved in a lot of further advance, uh, adventures. Uh, he goes out west after he leaves Springfield. He joins back up with the Army, serving under General Sherman, Winfield Scott. He serves with George Custer. Uh, there's an old story goes that Custer's wife and he had an affair. And indeed, if you read uh, Libby Custer's biography, of her husband, she talks in florid terms about Wild Bill Hickok. I mean, I'm telling you what, you almost have to kind of cool yourself down after you get done reading it. I mean, she really obviously was quite smitten with Wild Bill Hickok. And whether they had an affair or not, nobody knows. All we know is that uh, that's the rumor. And it seemed like there were rumors like that everywhere Wild Bill went. Uh, he becomes involved in buffalo hunting after he leaves the army. And that's where he meets up with another young man that he met earlier, Buffalo Bill Cody, who is becoming one of the big heroes of the old West. So he meets up with him again. And that's important as you'll see in a few minutes. 1867, he finally ends up in Hayes, Kansas, Hayes City, Kansas. Uh, Hayes City, Kansas had a reputation as the Sodom of the Plains. That was the, that was the railhead of 1867. Uh, where the Texas Cowboys were bringing their cows up to the railhead to put them on trains to ship them east. And it was the wildest west in the town of, of the west, the wild, wildest town of the west. And the city decided to hire Wild Bill to clean up Hay City. It's so bad that they say, hey, we know you're the greatest gunfighter of the old west read your dime novels we've heard about springfield and rock creek do you want to be our town marshal and he says sure i do and so he ends up cleaning up hayes city kansas the way that hickok cleans up hayes city kansas is anybody that crosses him he shoots him uh he, he's a no-nonsense law enforcement officer you know we all get this idea about white earp being a great law enforcement officer white earp really, except for the gun battle at Tombstone, never really was involved in a lot of gunfights. Uh, he preferred to cock people over the head with his gun. You know, uh, he, he wasn't one to really just shoot people just for the sake of shooting them. Um, Hickok, you cross him, you don't do what he tells you to do, he shoots you. That's as simple as it. 
In fact, in case he did it so often, the town father said, hey, uh, you know, enough is enough. Go on. You know, we've had enough of your cleaning up here. So he heads, this is a photograph of Wild Bill about the time of Hayes City, Kansas. He goes out to the next big town, Abilene, Kansas. Abilene is the toughest town in America. That was the name that they'd given it in 1868. He's hired on to be the marshal at, town, at Abilene. He's told to clean up that town. And he goes about it again, doing just exactly what he did in Hayes City. Uh, anybody gets in his way, he kills them. We don't know exactly how many people Wild Bill killed in his life, I'll be honest. The best estimate is about 15. Uh, most of these, as he was involved in Hayes City and Abilene, Kansas. Uh, we know one gunfighter that he killed was notorious gunfighter Phil Cole. Uh, we know that he had other scrapes um, with some famous gunfighters. Um, the uh, thing that kind of put him over the end was one night when he was facing down a crowd, apparently a crowd of cowboys had gathered and they were involved in hurrahing somebody and, and pestering somebody. And Ab Hickok comes out from his office and basically I think he ends up shooting somebody. And while he's out standing in front of the crowd waiting for them to break up, he sees somebody out of his you know, vision off to the side seeing somebody running at him. He thinks it's one of the cowboys. He wheels, turns, and shoots him and kills him. Ends up being his deputy, Mike Williams. His best friend, Hickok didn't have a lot of friends. I'm not, about, I'm not gonna lie to you. Most people didn't want to be friends with Hickok because he wasn't exactly the friendliest person. And frankly, it's kind of dangerous to know him uh, and be a friend with him. So he just goes over the edge. I mean, he absolutely just, uh, you know, becomes almost mentally deranged, goes into a deep depression, begins to really drink heavily and the city ends up firing him. Basically, Abilene says, hey, we can't have you here anymore. Take off. In a sense, Hickok's reputation is kind of on the downhill slide. No other town wants to hire him as town marshal because they're afraid of what he'll do. By the way, this is a scene of Abilene about the time that Hickok cleans it up. Well, how does he end up in Deadwood? Well, what most people don't realize is that maybe one of the reasons he shot his own deputy was because he was suffering from a very serious eye deterioration. Probably glaucoma, very possibly as a result of syphilis. In other words, he was going blind, folks. Not a good thing to have happen if you're a gunfighter. So, Wild Bill doesn't know what to do. Uh, he ends up meeting back up with Buffalo Bill. And Buffalo Bill, by this time, has figured out. Buffalo Bill's a showman. But Buffalo Bill's a lot smarter than a lot of the people out in the Old West. And he says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a show back east. And I'm going to take my show back to the east and show all these, new, all these New York people and big city people what it's like out in the west. And they're going to pay me money. This is his precursor to his Wild West show, which becomes the biggest thing in the West in the late 1800s. His first show was something called the Scouts of the Plains. It was a stage show. Uh, he would go into theaters and basically he and the guys around him would just uh, talk and tell their stories and put on little scenarios uh, kind of thing. So Hickok goes back East for a short period of time, about six months and hooks up with Buffalo Billy, Buffalo Bill and his Scouts of the Plains. But it's a disaster, folks. I mean, it's a horrible disaster. He's drinking heavy. He's drunk a lot. Uh, his eyesight deteriorating. Uh, he ends up doing some stupid stuff, like instead of loading his gun with blanks, he loads it with real bullets and shoots out lanterns and into the audience. And uh, it's just, you know, it's a miracle he didn't kill somebody. Buffalo Bill basically says, I can't have you here anymore, Bill. You're, you're, you know, I'm sorry. I love you. You're a good friend, but you're a danger to me. You got to go. So Hickok, in a sense, is fired. Before he leaves New York City, he marries a lady by the name of Agnes Lake. Agnes Lake is like 15 years older than Hickok. Hickok's in his 
late thirties. She's uh, basically in her mid fifties. And, uh, you know, she owns a circus and she's kind of a celebrity in her own right. And he marries this woman out of nowhere. Uh, a lot of opinion about why he married her, but a lot of people think that he married her uh, for her money, thinking that he was somebody who's going to have to take care of him in his old age. They never really lived together. Uh, they get married, but they don't really live together. He goes out back out to Colorado and gambles and does what he does best. Uh, and all the time, people were trying to get him into gunfights because, you know, they want to they want to get a reputation. They don't realize that Wild Bill's going blind, uh, and he's avoiding gunfights at this time. He finally hears there's a big strike of gold in Deadwood, South Dakota, uh, and he heads out to Deadwood, South Dakota in the summer of 1876. Uh, ends up out there. By the way, he's out there just right after Custer is annihilated in, uh, you know, in Montana. Uh, this is a picture of Hickok and the Wild West show. This is Hickok. This is Wild Bill, uh, pardon me, Buffalo Bill Cody. So, and these are just two other stars, uh, the, uh, three other stars of the show. But these are the two main ones, Cody here and Hickok here. So he goes out to, and this is Agnes Lake, the lady he marries. He goes out to Deadwood, South Dakota. He gets out there and immediately people start thinking, oh my gosh, he's come to clean up Deadwood. Deadwood is a, is a horrible town. I mean, it is just run by criminal elements. They don't want to be cleaned up. They, they, the people that run Deadwood are their gamblers and the, and the brothel owners and all this, and they don't have any sense of wanting to have Deadwood cleaned up. They love it the way it is. And they think that Hickok has come out here to clean up Deadwood. So there is actually an assassination plot drawn up uh, to have him killed. Uh, he's also out here. He meets up with uh, Calamity Jane, Martha Canary. Um, she apparently has a big crush on Hickok, but Hickok doesn't want to have anything to do with her, the story goes, because she's just a nasty old woman, you know, and uh, he had a little bit better uh, sense than that. There's a plot develops to have Hickok assassinated. And they hire a drunk kid by the name of Jack McCall to do the job. And the story goes, I'm sure you've all heard of it. August 2nd, 1876, Hickok walks into saloon number 10 in Deadwood, uh, sits down to play poker. He always sits with his back to the wall so he can see everything that's going on in front of him because he doesn't want anyone sneaking up behind him. That day, uh, for whatever reason, he sat with his back towards the back door. Uh, he starts gambling, uh, supposedly has a poker hand of aces and eights, which becomes known as the dead man's hand. McCall finds out he's in there. He walks in the back door, walks up to the back of Wild Bill and puts a gun to the back of the head and kills him. Thus ends the story of Wild Bill Hickok. So, uh, by the way, McCall's tried twice before he's hung. This is Deadwood, about the time that Hickok would have been there. Uh, just a completely notorious Wild West town. Uh, this is Jack McCall. Uh, this is Calamity Jane, just an old meal skinner. She could out cuss, out shoot, out drink, you know, any man alive. You know, that was the story that goes about Calamity Jane. So Hickok is immortalized. He's 39 years old. Uh, he's gained a reputation as the greatest gunfighter of the old west and when he dies that reputation sticks he probably was folks the greatest gunfighter of the old west a lot of times people don't deserve the reputation of out of these western characters he probably deserved it uh he probably was the greatest shot of all these guys that we know about you know people like billy the kid that supposedly killed 21 men billy the kid would kill you in the shoot you in the back from behind a rock or out of a window you know he never shot somebody in a you know stand-up gunfight like Wild Bill Hickok did. Uh, so he's buried in Mount Moriah Cemetery. If you've been to Deadwood, I bet you've gone to Mount Moriah Cemetery and you've seen him buried there uh, next to Calamity Jane. She wanted to be buried next to Wild Bill. And I've always said, knowing what I know about Wild Bill and reading several books on him, I'm sure he's spinning in his grave 
thinking he's got to spend eternity with his body sitting next to this nasty old woman because she was just a mule skinner, you know. So Hickok's last known photo. This was a photo that was taken in Colorado before he went to Deadwood. And you can see age is starting to take a toll on him. He's puffy. He's been drinking. Uh, he's just, he's not as same as he was out at Abilene and Hay City in Springfield. So that's the end of Wild Bill Hickok and his escapades in Springfield, Missouri. Next week, we're going to talk about another big event that occurs in the Ozarks in the period right after the Civil War. And that's something called the Ball Knobbers. Now, if you've been to Branson, I bet you've been to the Ball Knobbers music show. We're not talking about the Ball Knobbers music show. We're talking about a vigilante group that becomes nationally famous in the late 1800s as a result of their escapades in the Ozarks. So I appreciate you being with me. <clears throat> I hope you've learned something. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, we will see you next week. Very good. Hey, Guy, Guy Penrod's going to be in Joplin next, uh, this coming Friday. I'm sorry, I didn't get that, Donna. Guy Penrod is going to be in Joplin.